You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Learn what affects your credit scores and what you can do to improve them with Credit Karma. Maybe you need to dispute an error on your credit report or you're paying too much interest. Credit Karma can help with that. Visit CreditKarma.com or download the app now. That's Credit Karma, K-A-R-M-A dot com. Stop for Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. Lots of stuff to get into today. Of course, the NCAA, they've got a commission. They've got a recommendation from the commission. We definitely will be talking about that. Apparently, the commission has proposed getting rid of the NBA's one-and-done rule. The NCAA's one-and-done rule, rather. The NBA, you know, with their 19 and all, you know, 19 years or, you know, one year removed from that. They made some suggestions with that. Basically talking about the NCAA working in concert with the NBA. There's some things they did do that I liked. There are other things they didn't suggest just that I did not like. These are the kind of things that we get into, we will get into as the show progresses today right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. That's one thing that we definitely will get into. The other is Meek Mill. Meek Mill, rap artist out of Philadelphia, freshly released from Pennsylvania State Penitentiary. You know, no doubt. Robert Kraft, owner of the New England Patriots, along with Michael Rubin, the uh, minority owner for the Philadelphia 76ers, had something to do with that. Rubin picked him up himself, heliported him into the stadium. Wells Fargo Center last night in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I was in attendance. And, yes, I did see and speak to Meek Mill, and I'll share that with you a little bit later on in the show. But the bottom line is clear. He is out of prison. He is free. And how do I feel about All of the roaring and the hoopla that was, and a celebration that was associated with it. I'll share that with you in just a few minutes. But first things first, because the first thing that we got to get into are the games themselves. And what it comes down to is this. The Warriors finished off the San Antonio Spurs in five games last night. They take on the New Orleans Pelicans next. The Philadelphia 76ers, they took the Miami Heat out in five. As a result, they face the winner of Boston-Milwaukee next. In all likelihood, it'll be Boston. The Cleveland Cavaliers play a game tonight. Could this be LeBron James' last game in Cleveland? I'm here to tell you that answer is no. Cleveland's not losing tonight. Cleveland's going to win this series in six games as far as I'm concerned. Indiana, I like them a lot. Oladipo is a star, but there are levels to this. And LeBron is on another level. And even though he appears to be a one-man wrecking crew against this particular team, I think it's going to be enough. So the real question to me is not about LeBron James in terms of whether or not this is his last game in Cleveland because of a loss, a potential loss, and then a potential loss in game six. To me, the issue is us asking that question at all. Have we reached a conclusion where there is no way in hell that LeBron James is staying in Cleveland? Have we reached a conclusion that not only do we believe he's gone and he's not going to stay in Cleveland, have we asked ourselves, would he be completely justified? And after we answer those questions, then we must ask ourselves this, ourselves this, where would be the best place for for LeBron James to go? Should he come to New York and and join Kristaps Porzingis? Should he go to L.A. and join Kuzma and Randall and Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram? Should he go to Houston where he could join CP3 and James Harden? Or should he come to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to join Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid and about five dudes over six feet six who can all shoot, and I haven't even brought J.J. Redick into the equation, who's their best shooter, most experienced player, and signed a one-year $23 million deal last summer to be here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I must say to you, not that I feel this way, but on this particular moment, just to bring some, some levity to the situation, in this particular moment, if I wanted to have something against J.J. Reddick, it would be justified. Now, Stephen A., oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, Stephen A., what what are you talking about? This is the first I'm hearing of this. How did this happen? What are you doing turning against J.J. Reddick? I'll tell you how. I'm not going to tell you where, but all I'll tell you is this. Yesterday, at an undisclosed location, 
I was cornered. Ben Simmons, Robert Covington, J.J. Redick, and that turncoat, one of my best buddies in the world, who works for the Philadelphia 76ers. His name is Al Lumpkin. That Benedict Arnold, that, 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 that turncoat, he betrayed me. They all cornered me. How dare you pick Donovan Mitchell over Ben Simmons for your rookie of the year vote? They cornered me. I won't say they were quite intimidating. J.J. Reddick, he did everything but call me an idiot. He did everything but call me an idiot. And I got to say this to you, as offended as I am. I was kind of scared. I was kind of scared. Because, damn it, they were making some good arguments. <laughs> I got to confess it. I got to confess it. They, they had me, they had me cornered. I mean, it was a tough, it was a tough, tough, it was a tough, tough meeting. I got to confess. I got to confess. I felt like, I felt like I was in front of the Justice Department. I mean, it was bad. They cornered me. Okay. And they made some very good arguments. If I should say so myself, I couldn't even deny it. But I prevailed, ladies and gentlemen. I stood my ground. And J.J. Reddick looked at me with such disgust. I, I almost forgot I was cool with the brother. I almost forgot I was cool with him. I really, really did. But it was a fun moment. And they do make some very compelling arguments on behalf of um of uh, Ben Simmons for Rookie of the Year honors. There's no question about it. But transcending beyond that, the Philadelphia 76ers are for real to me, y'all. They just are. They just loaded. They have depth. They have size. They have athleticism. They have leadership. Um, they've got a point guard in Ben Simmons, who is a superstar in the making. They just got it all, man. They, they this is a special, special crew, and I think that they're gonna go to the finals. Now, do I think they would beat the Golden State Warriors with Steph Curry? Absolutely not. But I do believe. If Steph Curry comes back and they're healthy, the Golden State Warriors against the Philadelphia 76ers would be a tremendous NBA final series. I really, really believe that. I think it would be something special to behold. It would. Houston against Philly would be great, too. Now, some people might look at me and say, Stephen A., you're so disrespectful. Why are you just dismissing Boston? I'm not really trying to dismiss anybody. I think Boston, with their talent, and with Jalen Brown, who I love, I love this brother, I just believe that with Kyrie and Gordon Hayward both out, you just don't have enough of this Sixers team. Because Ben Simmons with Joel and B, the combination of what they do on a basketball court opens things for shooters. And Bellanova, can, Bellinelli can shoot. Ilasova can shoot. Covington can shoot. Reddick is a sniper. Anderson can shoot. And when you look at this team and what they bring to the table and the fact that they hit perimeter shots and they defend, I can't say enough. I just can't say enough about what I see from these Philadelphia 76ers. It simply cannot be ignored. The time has come. The time has arrived for us to concede that. Now, you got other people holding on to Toronto. They're looking at Boston. Those are the two biggest threats. They're not showing the Washington Wizards enough respect that maybe Washington deserves that at this particular moment in time, even though they've won two straight and they've notched that series with Toronto at 2-2. I look at Indiana. I'm not sold, y'all. I think LeBron wins this series of six games, like I said before the series began. But I'm just of the mindset right now, the big question right now, is where should LeBron go next? See, to me, if you're just thinking about basketball, of course you say Philly. Because LeBron with Ben Simmons would almost be unfair. The flip side to it, however, is what if you're looking beyond basketball and you're asking yourself, LeBron, if you leave Cleveland, really? That's where you'd go? Right up the road to Philadelphia? I mean, damn. I mean, come on. I don't know. I just don't know. I'm just of the mindset that if I'm LeBron, if I'm going to leave, I'm going to go out west. Go Hollywood. Bring another star with you. 
If I'm LeBron, I'm trying to get Magic to get Kawhi. LeBron and Kawhi together? Lord, that could be special. With the young guns with a Kuzma and the young guns that they've got? I like that. These are all things that are worthy of consideration. These are all things that would be incredibly interesting and are the kind of things that you can't ignore. That's just the way that I feel about it. 888, say ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. That's one of the many things that we plan on getting into today right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show ESPN Radio. Look, last night was a surreal experience in its own right, okay? Um, We got to look at things for what they are. I met Meek Mill for the first time last night. Um, I saw him heliported into the stadium. I saw the Sixers bring him to midcourt to ring the bell. He was sitting right next to Kevin Hart. It's good to see him. You know, he's a Philadelphian, former undisputed middleweight champion of the world. Bernard Hopkins was in attendance. Bernard Hopkins screamed in my ear about the, how there's a whole bunch of Meek Mills in prison. There's a whole bunch of folks. And what was he alluding to? I think it's time for us to be careful and to really dissect this for what it is and really dig deep into exactly what transpired and why it's so important for all of us to sit up there and just look at things for the way they are and the way they should be. On one hand, we have to think about something here. The issue of mass incarceration and a parole slash probationary system in this country is something to take a good, long, hard look at. It can't be ignored. It simply can't. You have a situation right now where in Philadelphia, you're talking about a probationary, uh, a probation rate. That's the highest arguably in the country. You're talking about folks being labeled as parole violators because they left the state when what they did was leave Philadelphia and go to Cherry Hill, New Jersey for dinner. And because they cross state lines, you're in violation of your probation and you get to sit in jail at the discretion of the judge until the judge elects to let you out. And sometimes that's three, four, five months at a time. And all we hear is that you violated your parole, but people are trying to give the impression that you've committed a crime. These are the kind of things that we've got to pay attention to. Meek Mill ultimately was accused of violation, violating his probation and I forgot what it was about, but Pop and Wheelies had something to do with it. And so the judge wants to bring the hammer down. Even the prosecutor did not recommend jail time. If the prosecutor didn't recommend jail time and you've got a defense attorney that's saying this is personal and a judge who handed down a sentence to him from a decade earlier and somehow, some way, this same judge keeps presiding over him. And she's talking about sending a message. Does that sound, does that not sound personal to you? So in that regard, you hear those kind of things and you're saying, this is a bit excessive. This is a bit too much. There's something wrong with this picture and there's something that needs to be d- to be done about this. The judge, Brinkley, sentenced Miller two to four years in prison for violating probation. She cited a failed drug test, failure to comply with an order restricting his travel and two other unrelated arrests. One in St. Louis for a fight in an airport where charges against him were later dropped and the other for reckless driving in New York City when he was popping wheelies. Two to four years in prison for that. We have to start thinking about things like that. To me, we also need to start thinking about who's profiting over the off, off of the prison systems. Last time I, ch- I checked, you've got some private contractors owning prisons. You flood those prisons. It's good for business. 
So is it really about laws? Is it really about morals? Or is it really about feeding a system monetarily into perpetuity? What is it about? Now I say all of that by saying this. I don't know Meek Mill from a can of paint. I've listened to a couple of his records. I know he's pretty damn talented. I know he used to date Nicki Minaj. No crime in that. I also know I met him for the first time last night. He was incredibly nice to me. I wish him nothing but the best. I'm a fan of second chances. I think that people who make mistakes be given an opportunity to rectify themselves and to be steered in the right direction. I, however, don't ignore the multitude of arrests and violations that existed from years ago. How those things should have never happened. And how in a system of laws, laws have to be enforced because that ultimately has to serve as a deterrent for, for actions to not be repeated. So what I'm saying and why I bring that up is that Let's make sure that if we're celebrating the release of Meek Mill and I have nothing against this brother, I don't know the particulars. I'm not judging him. He's out of jail. I wish him nothing but the best. I even invited him on first take because he said he's a fan of the show and he watches it all the time. Every weekday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time. I guess they allowed him to watch it in prison. I got nothing but love for the brother. Wish him nothing but the best. But I want to make sure that everybody understands that if you see folks protesting and you see folks ultimately celebrating his release, understand why. O.J. Simpson, for example, had absolutely positively nothing to do with a Meek Mill case. That was a double murder. If it were up to me, O.J. would be under the jail with the sodomites. For the rest of his natural life. Obviously, Meek Mill doesn't deserve something like that. And I'm not comparing the two, but I'm speaking specifically as it pertains to the celebrations. Folks in the streets that were celebrating OJ's release as abhorrent and repulsive as that appeared, even to me. Because his behind should have been in jail. I also knew why. So often, so many times, minorities, in particular African-Americans, have been so victimized by the quote-unquote system that it was nice to see the system get screwed over for a change as it pertained to O.J. That's just a fact. I'm just giving it to you real. In the case of Meek Mill, this is not the system being screwed over. This is the system working in a manner that it's supposed to, where the actions of a particular judge in a position of power, obviously, have been usurped by a higher authority of judges who said there's something wrong with this. And we're going to need this man to be released. And while we're at that, ladies and gentlemen, as sickening as it may be, For some of us, particularly from the minority communities, to always see someone from the white community getting credit. Facts are facts. Don't think for one second that Robert Kraft and Michael Rubin had nothing to do with his release. When a billionaire owner for the NFL shows up to support you and an owner for an NBA franchise shows up to support you, And they have, they represent a league that's predominantly black, that rakes in billions for a local economy. That kind of matters whether you like it or not. So there's credit to be spread and circulated all around here. And there is cause to celebrate. Meek Mill's release. 
But whether it pertains to Meek Mill specifically depends on how he conducts himself moving forward to make sure that the efforts on his behalf were not in vain. But the real reason for the celebration is that our system of justice has provided us, has provided us all with hope that the issue of mass incarcerations, that the probations and the parole system that exists in our country has to be addressed quick, fast, and in a hurry. And this was a profound step in doing just that. That is the reason that we should be celebrating Meek Mill's release. And if indeed that is the reason we're celebrating, then cheer on, cheer on. If Meek Mill specifically is the reason and the only reason we're celebrating it, then whether or not our celebration was in vain, is entirely up to him. Straight Talk Wireless, nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. Craving even more of Stephen A? Him of all people! For around-the-clock access to the man? I'm Stephen A! You can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Stephen A. Smith and on Facebook at Stephen A. Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive's Home Insurance. Get your quote at Progressive.com today. News came out this morning. And reading from a story in the Associated Press, the Commission on College Basketball sharply directed the NCAA to take control of the sport, calling for sweeping reforms to minimize one and done, permit players to return to school after going undrafted by the NBA, and banning cheating coaches for life. The Independent Commission, led by former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, released a detailed 60-page report Wednesday, seven months after the group was formed by the NCAA in response to a federal corruption investigation that rocked college basketball. Ten people, including some assistant coaches, have been charged in a bribery and kickback scheme, and high-profile programs such as Arizona, Louisville, and Kansas have been tied to possible NCAA violations. Quote, the members of this commission come from a wide variety of backgrounds, but the one thing that they share in common is that they believe the college basketball Enterprise is worth saving, Rice told the Associated Press. We believe there's a lot of work to do in that regard, that the state of the game is not very strong. We had to be bold in our recommendations. The Stephen A. Smith Show will definitely do what we can to try and get uh, Condoleezza Rice on this show in the very, very near future. Looking forward to um, talking to her whenever I'm privileged to have that day occur. Definitely something that... um. I'm looking forward to. Here's my issue. I have no problem with their position on a one and done rule. It needs to go. I love the fact that they want to allow players who entered the NBA draft, but did not get drafted to return back to college basketball. I love that. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love the idea of a lifetime ban for coaches who are violators you know, of, of, of major transgressions, you know, major violations. Those who commit them should be banned for life. Here's one thing that I would say I wish I would have seen, if not two things. A, I wish I would have seen. I wish I would have seen them say, not only are you banned for life from college basketball, we've reached an agreement with the NBA that says you're going to be banned from them too. And if least, and if, 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 and if not total outright banishment, at least say you can't be a head coach on the NBA level. That would be nice. Because if you're the NBA, why should you want cheats in your league? So I cheat in college basketball, but I'm going to come to your league. Why would you want that? Band together as lovers of basketball and demand that a certain level of integrity is exercised no matter what. If you can't do that, why should you be there? So that's a big deal with me. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be allowed a second chance, even if you commit a major violation. I'm not saying you shouldn't be allowed a a second chance to work. I'm saying you shouldn't be allowed a second chance at that particular job. In other words, you can never be a head coach again. You'd be an assistant. 
You be, you know, you can be an assistant coach. You be a scout. You be something like that, but you are not allowed to ever be the head coach of a program again. That's what I am a proponent of. So I look at that idea and that really, really resonates with me. Outside of that, the one other thing that I didn't see that I would have liked to have seen, um, I would like to have seen the sneaker companies addressed. They have incredible influence. It's not about the AAU coaches. Somebody's paying them and the high school coaches. Who do you think it is? It's the sneaker companies. When you get, when you get involved with the sneaker companies and you start highlighting the role that they play in influencing who's hired, and influencing the power of a program because of the money that they funnel in the programs, those are things that can't be ignored, and I don't think they should be. So I think that those are the kind of things that I was missing from this board. The AEU is not the problem. It's who's, fun, it's, who, it's who's financing them that's the problem. And see, we say this, and we might have a, we might have, think about this. I'm going to tell you who comes out looking really pretty in all of this. LaVar Ball. Heard that name in a while, have you? Haven't heard that name in a while, have you? In Lithuania with his sons, for the most part. I think he's back by now. But let me tell you why he comes up looking good. Because the things that he was trying to do, he talked about what the NCAA has been doing. And he said, why on earth should I have to deal with that? He said, folks exploit our children all the time. Why can't we exploit them if the ones who are benefiting are their own families? Why can't we do that? It's just me. It's just me. 888-SAY-ESPN is 888-729-3776. That's one item I want to touch on. Here's the other item. New York Times. Article written today. Headline. Inside the confidential NFL meeting to discuss national anthem. And I read the first couple of graphs to you because this is very important. NFL owners, players, and league executives, about 30 in all, convened urgently at the league's headquarters on Park Avenue in October, nearly a month after President Trump began deriding the league and its players over protests during the national anthem. It was an extraordinary summit. Rarely do owners and players meet in this manner. But the president's remarks about players who were kneeling during the anthem had catalyzed the level of public hostility that the NFL had never experienced. In the spirit of partnership at the meeting, the owners decided that they and the players should sit, should sit in alternating seats around the large table that featured an NFL logo in the middle. Quote, let's make sure that we keep this confidential, Commissioner Roger Goodell said to begin the meeting. And then the next very next graph in the article says the New York Times has obtained an audio recording of the roughly three hour meeting and several people in the room corroborated details of the gathering. See, that's the problem. That's the problem. Now, we might learn some things because we've learned a few things. Uh, Eric Reed, Colin Kaepernick's former teammate, the first to kneel uh, beside him, uh, talked about them wanting justice and what have you, but Colin Kaepernick still doesn't have a job. Reed attended the meeting wearing a Colin Kaepernick T-shirt over his dress shirt and tie. He says, I feel like he was hung out to dry. Everyone in here is talking about how much they support us. Nobody stepped up and said, we support Colin's right to do this. We all let him become public enemy number one in this country, and he still doesn't have a job. That's what Eric Reed said, but that was the only time Colin Kaepernick was brought up. Outside of that, the owners needed to address it because Robert Kraft was talking about the big elephant in the room. I shouldn't say Eric Reed was the only one that brought up Colin Kaepernick. Chris Long, according to this article, he brought him up as well. He said if he was on a roster right now, all this negativeness and divisiveness could be turned into a positive. Long said he did not wish to lecture any team on what quarterbacks to sign, but, quote, we all agree in this room as players that he, Colin Kaepernick, should be on a roster. The owner's responses were noncommittal. The Eagles owner, Jeffrey Lurie, said that fighting for social justice is not about one person. He called Trump. I'm sorry, Robert Kraft, the owner, the elephant in the room, called his friend, who he's been a longtime supporter of. He said it's divisive and horrible what Trump was doing. Lori called Trump's presidency disastrous. Buffalo Bills owner Terry Pagulia sounded anguished over the uncertainty of when Trump would take another shot at the league. 
All Donald needs to do is to start to do this again. We need some kind of immediate plan because of what's going on in our society. All of us now, we need to put a Band-Aid on what's going on in this country. Jacksonville Jaguars owner from Pakistan, Shad Khan, Shad Khan, countered that the worst was behind them. He said all the damage Trump's going to do is done. The owners kept returning to one bottom line issue. Large numbers of fans and sponsors had become angry about the protests. Boycotts had been threatened and jerseys burned. And most worrisome, TV ratings were declining. Houston Texans owner Bob McNair, we all remember him, right? Can't let those inmates run the asylums. Remember him? He said, you fellas need to ask your compadres. This is this. I'm reading from the time. I'm reading from the time. Here. This is not me. He said, you fellas need to ask your compadres. Fellas, stop that other business. Let's go out and do something that really produces positive results and we'll help you. That's what McNair said. Stephen Ross raised the idea of a march on Washington by NFL players and owners. They weren't really trying to hear that one. Okay. And by the way, if you're wondering about the march on Washington and how some folks outside the black community might feel about another march, go watch Dave Chappelle on Netflix. He said if Martin Luther King uh, had a sneaker deal, he'd be he'd be gone. He would have been gone. He would have never become who he became. He'd march on Washington. Dave Chappelle did some skit talking about, Martin, we really, we really love the march. He said, we really need you to tone down the rhetoric. But I don't understand. I thought that's why I had a sneaker deal in the first place. Yeah, the marching, the marching, we, we know, we've got no problem with that. But the rhetoric, oh. Go see Dave Chappelle on Netflix. It was hilarious. But you get the picture and you get the point, don't you? When you talk about these things, they're sensitive subjects. I mean, you talk about, think about it. Before the meeting, owners had quoted uh, Thomas Paine. That was Arthur Blank. Martin Luther King Jr. Selma March. Ross from the Dolphins. And Giants owner John Mara Expressed hope. We have a chance to do something monumental. Demora Smith, executive director of the Players Union, said, I like the language of, quote, unquote, our issues. And, of course, they ultimately issued a statement saying NFL executives and owners joined NFLPA executives and players leaders to review and discuss plans to utilize our platform to promote equality and effectuate positive change. Here's the problem with all of this, ladies and gentlemen. The meeting was leaked. And when you have a meeting that's leaked, trust diminishes drastically, which means another meeting like this either wouldn't take place or there would be nothing authentic that came out of it because people would be worried about being taped secretly. Trust matters. Trust was violated here. And whoever did it, whether it was an owner or a player, whomever did it should be ashamed of themselves. They cannot be trusted. You could have simply come out went on camera and said what you had to say to secretly tape somebody and put them in that position is wrong because it builds and foments distrust. And you can't do that and expect to be dealt with on the up and up in a world of business. Now, having said all of that, notice how they talked about doing something that we could do to provoke change. Notice how everyone was noncommittal about Colin Kaepernick. You know why they were noncommittal about Colin Kaepernick? Because Colin Kaepernick is not the issue to them. Their money is. And their attitude is, we have nothing against Colin Kaepernick other than the fact he's costing us money. If he wasn't costing us money, we wouldn't care. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in the world of business, I want you to tell me where you can find somebody that's going to think otherwise. I want you to show me where you're going to find somebody that's not going to give a damn about the bottom line. And all they care about is doing the right thing. We're not talking utopia here. We're just, we're just not. The fact of the matter is, is that if you are a person, if you are a person, that is a business owner. 
it's virtually impossible to believe that you're not going to care about the bottom line. So Eric Reed coming in there with the Colin Kaepernick shirt on over his shirt and tie is admirable. I applaud his courage. But Nuno, John, could y'all double check for me? Didn't Eric Reed say he wasn't going to kneel anymore? I think he did. Let me double check that. Because you see, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty sure that he did say that. I'm pretty sure that he said that. See, these are the kind of things that we got to be put on our big boy and our big girl pants about. If you affect somebody's bottom line, they're going to get rid of you. Eric Reed, March 23rd, 2018, says he will not protest during the national anthem if an NFL team signs him. That was the headline. So as much as he stuck out his chest and voiced his dismay and concern, he still capitulated. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying that to insult Eric Reed one bit. I think he's smart because what more can you do? Your message has been sent. He's not punking out or anything. He's being wise. Some of you might feel differently. But then again, some of you might not be smart. 888-SAY-ESPN is 888-729-3776. Let's just keep it real. In the world of business, bottom line comes first. Everything else is second. It's not all that matters, but damn it, it matters most. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.